the mad thing was 22-19 is the final result, but Ireland scored their last point in the 30th minute. Like, it, mental. They didn't score a point for the last 50 minutes of the game, but they got themselves into a position 22-9 up um, and, you know, playing some really good stuff. McCarthy played well, apart from his yellow card. Um, but Crowley was going really well. And then errors crept in, didn't they? Um, and, you know, Crowley made a couple of errors. The team weren't as fluid as they could have been. Their discipline let them down a bit and momentum swung back to Argentina. And at the end, the Argentinians were raging with the invisible knock-on. But your thoughts on it, Jim? I thought Argentina was sensational. And yeah. I think there is a lot of people that probably don't think Argentina are as good as they are and me being one of them as well. I just think historically over the years, we know they've had big games in them and then they struggle with consistency. But I think we're now seeing under Felipe Contepomi, but these are the real deal and the quality of players and we can start name dropping them soon. But just as a team, the way in which they play, you know, the fact that their discipline is so much better than it was. Like you mentioned Juan Cruz Malia, but just the quality of some of their backs. They're very different because we were talking about the physicality and the phys physical humans and the South Africans and the All Blacks and the Australia have got these great athletes. Argentina go about it a very different way uh, in terms of their skill set, the way that they can whip the ball. And I don't know what the speed of ball is. I don't even know if there's a, a metric for that to measure, like how quickly you could get a ball from left to right. But the speed of passing looks like it's the fastest in world rugby. We know their rook speed is the fastest in world rugby, but just collectively, they're very, very good. Like historically, great scrum, great line out, which still stands. But I was very impressed with them. I thought Ireland were going to win comfortably. And the first half and the first 20 minutes, it was looking that way. But the way that they stuck in there, and that's what a Felipe Contepomi team you expect, right? You think of his history, yeah. both with... Argentina but with Leinster but he understands and that's the difference between someone like Michael Checker and I think Felipe Contepomi referenced it on commentary he knows how to work with the Latino craziness which we see in the French yeah. and the Italians and the Argentinians and I know the World Cup's a long way away this is a world-class team this Argentina team that we've seen so I know Ireland didn't score for 50 minutes or whatever it was but that's because Argentina are so good. I've seen some of the other yeah. comments of commentators and there's reasons, you know, around Ireland's line-out that isn't great or their discipline. But that's because Argentina are bloody unbelievable mm -hmm. as well and the quality of opposition. We'll talk about that with England and Wales. The quality of opposition of these Southern Hemisphere teams, and I think I've worked it all out. I think I've worked out why they're so good. No, Argentina didn't win, but they were bloody good. Keep talking about it. The Rugby Championship. The lead up to this, the games in which they've played, they were battle hardened. And I don't think Ireland ever looked like losing that game. I know the end was mm. quite tight, but yeah. to a man, I thought Argentina were wicked. Yeah. Albanoz at 10, I've talked about him a bit on here before, haven't I? Um, playing at Benetton. And, you know, last week he was good. His goal kicking was ridiculously good at the weekend. Kept him in touch, kept him in the game. You know, he's nudging everything from everywhere. Um, and then you look at some of the other boys. Sinti, who's at Sarri's at 13, he was great. Iskro at Quinn's, um, he was really good. Delgi on the wing as well, outstanding. And here's the thing, like Jim, you mentioned it then, and I completely agree with you around the Rugby Championship and they're battle-hardened. You know, they played in the Rugby Championship, what was it, two, three weeks ago, effectively, at the end of the tournament. But the amazing thing about Argentina and how well they're doing now, they're playing all over the fucking world. And that's like the thing. They, and they there haven't you even go, got Andrew. a team in Super Rugby. Mm. They haven't got a team in the URC or anything like that. They are coming from all over the world in all different leagues and environments. And they come together. And obviously that's the, the beauty of, of Felipe Contepomi and what he's done. You'd expect them with that sort of background of not having anything professional in their country in terms of a league and all that stuff to struggle a little bit. But they're punching above their weight. But that and shows you as well, Goody, that they're, they're, there's a shift. Because yeah. in England, we think it's all about playing in the Premiership and therefore that's how you play for England. Where I'm questioning now, and it's probably an easy question for people who don't watch the Premiership, or even if you do watch the Premiership, that we think that it's so much better than it actually is. 
But this is a great model. You see in the South Africans, they're playing all over the world and they come back for these international test windows, probably a bit fatigued. They're, they're definitely going to go back fatigued. But that is there's something in that. They're playing all over. They're playing in top 14. They're playing in the URC. They're playing in the Prem. Some of them have played over in New Zealand as well. And there's something in that. There, you ha- there has to be because of the quality of these Southern Hemisphere teams. I hear you. I hear you. What you're saying is we should let English boys go and play anywhere. The Southern Hemisphere, though, it definitely seems to be more aligned with their calendar. Obviously, they play the Rugby Championship. They're primed, aren't they, for these Autumn Nation Series games. Do you think if we played these same fixtures after the Six Nations, for example, do you think the Northern Hemisphere sides would be a different prospect? Who knows? Yeah, I do. Uh, uh, you, I mean, it is. You're right, Jim. Who knows? But um, I, do, I think we'd be better um, because you battle hard and similar to how they are now. Uh, and, you know, we, we've talked about it countless times on here about aligning the season and everything that goes with that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's chalk and cheese. You know, these boys for New Zealand, Australia, playing super rugby, which as a competition now, I'll be honest, I played in it, it when it was unbelievable. When South African teams were in it, Australians and New Zealanders and it was competitive and it was all the best players from those three countries playing in it. Now, that that tournament's garbage without being too harsh compared to what it was. Um, and obviously, the South Africans have aligned themselves with the URC. You know, there's actually a lot of South African players from that Springboks team who've gone home. So they've had, they've had their experiences around the world. Um, you know, and the, I'd say the majority of the South African squad without knowing the exact numbers are playing in Japan and South Africa. Um, you know, we've seen the likes of Sia Khaleesi, Evan Etzebeth. They've all tried it over in France. They've gone back. Chesney Colby was in France. I know he's in Japan now. Uh, Vinnie Cock was over in England, super successful with Jim at Saracens. Uh, he's played a bit in now. top 14 as well. Yeah, a little bit. It's Stade Francais, wasn't he? And he, he played about three games for Wasps before they went goodbye. But they're back. Coming back, Wasps. Get to that later. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what the right or wrong is around, you know, the best process but I'm looking at the South Africans best team in the world right now um, and they are going to have a lot of players that are going to play pretty much about 50 out of the 52 weeks a year because of all the games that they play um, so is that right? I don't know but they've gone back to South Africa because they've got their national team aligned with the Southern Hemisphere and their club team aligned with the Northern Hemisphere and they'll just get looked after better um, so imagine being like Take Juan Cruz Malia, for example, playing for Toulouse all year. And I'd love to know the stats of what how many games he played last year because he was playing regularly for Toulouse as a starter, whether it would be top 14, uh, whether it be top 14, Investec Champions Cup. Then he's gone, obviously, away to Argentina, played all over the summer. He's come back. He's played a couple of games in the top 14. And then he's gone back to Argentina now. And he's going to come back and, you know, go straight into... Champions Cup again uh, for Toulouse. So there's players like that that, are, you know, it's really hard for them. The best place to be, if you want to look after yourself, get the sushi and get to Japan, boys. Because as we spoke to a few of the lads out there, didn't we, in Jersey, Jim, a few, a few of the Springboks, they're all laughing. The boys that are in Japan because they play about six games a year and you know, no wonder they're ripe and ready for all the big games for South Africa. We had a look at Sam Prendergast as well. How did you, what did you make of him? Hmm. Oh, um, Jay, I thought it was all right. I thought You're not sure, right. Jim? I thought it was all right. Uh, in attacking, he's way too small at the minute. That's yeah, the I cru- hear that. That's the crux of it. And that's, I'm not trying to be harsh, I'm not trying to be negative as much as it sounds that way. Didn't look like he wanted to tackle either. He's got to put a bit of weight on. I say a bit of weight, it looks like he's got to put about five or six kgs. Great for Ireland to have another hey, young should- 10 coming through. But he should come and live with me for a debris. <laughs> it's a different kind of weight, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> the minute, too small. And he's playing against yeah. Argentina and he looked physically out of his depth. Attacking wise, looked great. Okay. Yeah. And you, you're watching him. Did they score when he was on? No. Okay. So it looked good in what he was doing. I'm not liking the, the shit that Jack Crowley's getting. He made a couple of errors in the game. He kicked one out on the full. I think there was one more error that I saw in him, but the first half, I thought, I thought he was brilliant. Um, Sam Prendergast will come through at some point. Bernard Jackman speaks about it. And everyone's talking about him, but he ain't ready. Yeah. Like, imagine him playing against South Africa or France. So he's 21, which is young-ish. He's got a lot of time 
There's part of me that's not happy that Frawley got bombed out as well for making t- two errors, but it is a ruthless <laughs> environment to be in, so I can see that. But from an island point of view, looking in, they're unsure on their 10. That's what it feels like. It feels like they're trying to make something happen. Prentagast isn't quite ready. Jack Crowley is first choice, but it's on a knife edge. There was talk of Frawley starting before the Autumn Nation series. And with that, there becomes an issue, doesn't there? Because the 10 has always been so important to Ireland because of Johnny Sexton. I, I heard Brian O'Driscoll talking about Johnny being in a training and there's still that maybe the shadow of the players around him because it's Johnny Sexton and maybe not been able to just take full lead on what they're doing. But I thought Jack Crowley started the game incredibly well. Like physically how he was playing his game management. I understand why Sam Prentagas came on. You can see Crowley wasn't happy when he came off, but that's just my opinion. Just looking at it, didn't score when he was on and physically he's too small at the minute. Mm. I, I agree with you. Like he, like he's for, for the one for the future. I don't think he's for the here and now. They've got a back Crowley, uh, and I'm with Jim. You know, Frawley hasn't done too much wrong. Um, made a couple of errors, of course, yeah. But when you talk about physicality, Jim, Ireland Fiji this weekend, you ain't starting Prendergast then, no? Well, that'd be interesting. <laughs> but you know what? As in, if you want to see if he's ready, put him in to the most physical team, and. No, in fact, don't. Don't do that. <laughs> they shouldn't do that. I'm not even trying to be a knob here. It, like, they shouldn't. It'd be ridiculous. I don't think he will. They, they, Andy Farrell's too smart. Oh, yeah, he is, he is. But they've got a balance now. They've got Prendergast coming through um, as a youngster. Crowley, I think you've got to back him. He's been very good for them. Um, and the worst thing teams can do, and I really believe in this, the worst thing some teams can do is drop and change your 10 too much. Back someone. Look at England with Marcus Smith. You know, look at um, you know, New Zealand have had that issue with, is it McKenzie, is it Barrett? And you can do the odd game horses for courses, but when you've got your best team, you start in 15. Look at South Africa at the weekend. Start mining the box. You know, need to change the game, rip him off and put Pollard on. But you need to back a starter. Um, and, you know, I believe that's Crowley. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby pod.